All right, hello everyone, uh, and thank you for being here for our event on the future of Turk the Turkish economy. Uh, my name is Jim Ryan. I'm the director of research at the Foreign Policy Research Institute and also the director of the Middle East program. Uh, and it's uh, my pleasure to have you all here today uh, for a conversation with uh, Bilge Yilmaz, who I'll introduce at more length uh, in a minute. Um, a couple of points of order be before we get started. Uh, first, I'd really like to extend a thank you uh, to our board of trustees, to our supporters and our donors. Uh, this, these conversations and Zoom events uh, are free to you, uh, but they're not free to us. Uh, and without their support, um, we couldn't make any of this possible. Uh, if you are not already uh, among our base of donors or supporters, um, please consider uh, supporting us. There are links in the chat uh, that you can uh, follow and uh, you know, provide you know support at a number of different levels, and we you know thank you very much for, if you're able to do that. A um, couple of reminders: uh, the convers we're about to have a conversation, uh, you know, about the future of the Turkish economy uh, in the midst of uh, an election season with uh, a representative from a, a political party. But I do want to say up front that uh, FPRI is a nonpartisan, uh, non-advocacy, nonprofit organization, and you know we have a great opportunity here to have. Uh, you know, an important dis a discussion of an important topic with a, a major player in Turkish politics, but we, we take a, a nonpartisan position as an organization. Um, and also, uh, you'll see throughout the event uh, in the chat box, some feedback forms. If you have any suggestions, comments, questions, anything like that about this event or FPRI events in general, please feel free to take a, a look at that form and submit uh, your comments and questions uh, that way regarding the event in general. If you want to ask a question uh, to myself and uh, Professor Yilmaz during this event, you have the opportunity to do so through the Q&A feature uh, in Zoom. And uh, we'll get to that after about 30 or 40 minutes once, uh, but you're more than welcome to insert those questions at, at any time. So uh, let's get into it. Uh, I'd like to uh, first you know, have a little bit of an introduction here for those who may or may not be familiar with the situation uh, that we're facing in Turkey. In less than two weeks, on May 14th, Turkey is holding the first round of what figures to be the most important general elections happening around the world this year, and certainly one that could fundamentally change the course uh, Turkey has been on for the last two decades. The general elections will decide who controls parliament, a body that's been sapped of its traditional powers since constitutional reforms were approved by referendum in 2017, to significantly empower the office of the president held by Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who has led the country as prime minister and now president since 2003. A unique set of coalitions have formed in advance of the elections to contest power in parliament, but in the all important race for president, the largest opposition parties all appear to have it united around the candidacy of Kemal Kilicdaroğlu, leader of the largest opposition party, the Republican People's Party. The coalition behind Kilicdaroğlu is ideologically broad. It includes mainline secularists, Islamists, nationalists, breakaway factions from Erdogan's party, and many others. Um, despite some of these deep philosophical and ideological differences, one of the uniting factors, it appears, in this coalition has been a shared criticism of Erdogan's handling of the economy. And to learn more about these, how economic issues are playing out in this uh, election, we've invited to join us today Professor Bilge Yilmaz, who is a senior economic advisor to the second largest opposition party in Turkey, the E party, and also a professor of finance at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, Bill Gay, thank you for being here and uh, say hi and introduce yourself. <laughs> well, thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you, it's a pleasure. Um, um, I, I obviously spend my um, almost entire career at uh, at uh, Penn at the Wharton School, a little bit of uh, time spent at Stanford, but my wife didn't want to live on the West Coast, believe it or not, so we had to come back to Wharton. But anyways, uh, joking aside a little bit, um, uh, so I lived in the States more than 30 years, first as a PhD student at Princeton, then junior faculty member at Wharton, then Stanford uh, at the mid-career level, at the associate professor level, and then I've been at Wharton for the last 14, 15 years. This had been a dramatic shift, obviously. I obviously I was born and raised in Turkey. I was always concerned about the well-being of the country. 
And about a year and a half ago, I joined uh, Madame Akshana, the chairwoman of the second largest opposition party. And a few months after that, December of 2021, I became the deputy chairman. So I became number two in the party. And I'm also head of economic policy unit as well. Mm -hmm. Um, So as the election approaches, uh, things uh, dramatically shift. So if you follow the news, I've become the front runner for the top seat in the cabinet running the Turkish economy post-election. But, you know, in Turkish politics, 24 hours is long. Two weeks is really (laughs) long. So who knows what's going to happen? Obviously, it's not clear whether we will win. And it's not terribly clear that I would actually end up with the top seat in the cabinet overseeing the part of the cabinet running the economy. But mm-hmm. at this moment, it seems like I'm the likely candidate, but that's where things stand. Yeah. So that's a fairly long introduction. So, uh, <laughs> well, so I'll know, stop here, Jim. Yeah, yeah. So uh, thank you for, for explaining that for our audience. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we certainly, you know, wish you some luck uh, there and i know you know probably as well as you do uh, or if not as well as you do pretty close to as well as you do how swiftly things change in turkish politics um but we're here to to you know mine your expertise as well as your your position within um the political arena as it is right now i, I want to start off with your view of the problem at hand you know in the early years of, of akp rule turkey was heralded as like an economic miracle you know the country weathered the 2008 financial crisis better than many others, uh, especially in its neighborhood. It seemed to be advancing out of what had been a very sluggish decade in the 1990s. Uh, And then in the last 10 years or so, we've seen a kind of unraveling, a market, and uh, this is marked most dramatically by the decline of of Turkey's currency, uh, the lira, which, I mean, when I first visited Turkey in 2006, uh, I think the exchange rate was about a dollar twenty-five or something like that to the lira, and now it's uh, something around nineteen dollars. So, you know, a, a nickel will buy you a lira uh, at the moment. Um, it, suffice it to say, um, you know, this has become a major issue in the campaign. I saw, you know, at least one poll last week that, you know, an issue poll for voters saying that the economy, you know, sixty percent of the respondents said the economy was the most important issue. So, um, you know. We'll get into maybe some of the details of, of, you know, the problem as it stands today. But tell us how we got here. Like, what 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 is your view of the problem at hand? Yeah, I mean, Jim, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, you gave a very good introduction uh, of as things developed in Turkey from the point of view of uh, really non-expert uh, view, because that's how people view Turkey's progress. I respectfully disagree with that description. However, I I really think that this black and white picture that one has reading New York Times or even more sophisticated uh, outlets for Turkey, uh, mostly for non-economists, uh, misses the main point, which is that even in the early years of 2000s, uh, when Turkish economy was booming under Erdogan's uh, management, we were actually guided towards a disaster. So it was really a disaster in the making. And and I really named this era, the era of tulips. Mm -hmm. Uh, So Turkey went through a decade of fairly happy times and wasted opportunities. And uh, obviously today the mistakes are tremendous, but a bad outcome was kind of inevitable in uh, what was done in 2000. So what happened is that in 2001, there was a fairly large financial crisis that turned into a real crisis. And Turkey invited IMF through uh, famous or infamous Kemal Davish Bayna uh, from World Bank. And under Kemal's uh, leadership, Turkey had a fairly successful austerity program implemented. I have some criticisms of Kemal's program, but but by and large, it was a successful program, and and it did achieve the financial stability. So macroeconomic stability was established, and and things worked well. And Turkey, uh, after two thousand two elections, in fact, Erdogan won the election, having the previous administration paid the price for the economic crisis and that actually swollen the poison pill, if you'd like, or the bitter pill, 
and put together a fairly good austerity program. And Turkey was climbing out of that crisis. And Erdogan basically had that free ride afterwards. And it, to his credit, he did implement the standby agreement IMF till 2005. And then 2005, he renewed another one till 2008. And they had followed through what IMF had recommended to them. So that had been successful. Both monetary and fiscal policy was successful. But what happened in early 2000s is that there was a wave of hope that Turkey might join the European Union. And finally, Turkey, after decades of high inflation, had a low inflation and macroeconomic stability. So two things happened. Uh, with the hopes of joining the European Union, there was a huge interest, especially from European companies, uh, buying assets in Turkey. So Turkey sold most of its state-owned assets. And Turkish economy mostly depended on state-owned uh, sectors, so government owned a lot of assets in Turkey. So Turkey sold most of it, mostly to foreigners, but to some domestic industrial families as well. Uh, and Turkey also borrowed a lot of money from uh, foreign investors as well. So the the inflows of foreign capital in in two thousands and some years before the two thousand eight crisis was approaching ten percent of the GDP. Think about that. 10% of the GDP is flowing in from, uh, from abroad into an economy. Through a multiplier, that obviously creates a huge momentum. And at the same time, because after decades of high inflation, Turkey now had low inflation, they managed to actually increase the debt capacity of the domestic markets. The board households and the firms borrowed heavily. GDP grew, but uh, as a percentage of GDP, both the households and the firms, the the, 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 the debt levels increased three to five times. Uh, so that created enormous always a stimulus in the economy. Money is flowing in from abroad and the domestics are borrowing a lot more heavily, which obviously provides more, uh, more juice for the economy. And that led to a fairly aggressive growth. And, and, and the, the, the problem with that is that Turkey didn't have a strategy for increasing its uh, productivity and, and, and they didn't have a agriculture or industrial policies in terms of reshaping the economy. Turkey had the chronic structural issues like cap, uh, chronic, uh, uh, chronic account deficit and many other issues, taxes and so on and so forth needed to be restructured. None of it took place. So when a country gets rapidly wealthy, like Turkey did in 2000s, you would expect many things. One is that Turkey, I mean, the country's uh, factor productivity would increase. First, the industrials, then the service sector would increase as a percent of the GDP. None of that happened in Turkey. So when you look at it as a percentage of GDP, uh, industrials remained constant. So did the service sector. The only sector that increased was construction and real estate. And the only sector that diminished was agriculture. So it just looked like Turkey was building a bunch of new buildings in a farmland. And in fact, that was really not that was not that far away from the truth. And that kind of investment of all those resources in construction and mostly real estate speculation and rent seeking behavior did not end well and could not have ended well. Because none of it increased uh, GDP in a, uh, in a structured way, and Turkish productivity remained low. And, and that kind of was an era that was bound to happen, uh, bound to end, and that's what happened. In 2000, obviously, the financial crisis came along in 2008. That was mostly made in North America, as you know. Uh, and Turkey's economy, thanks to reforms of 2001, Kemal Davish's reforms, was very robust. The corruption hadn't led to uh, the formation of the banking sector. So Turkish banks were highly regulated and extremely healthy. They were not levered like their U.S. counterparts. So they did very well. But uh, as this system was not sustainable and Turkey couldn't sustain this these happy times, they started to cheat and cut corners. So 2011 was the beginning of the new era where AKP, Erdogan's cronies or Erdogan's uh, lieutenants started to actually deviate from uh, what IMF had told them to do. And starting 2011, first the monetary policy deviated from the optimal one and then followed by the fiscal policy a few years later. But if you pause for a moment and compare Turkey with its neighbors in Eastern Europe, 
Turkey's GDP per capita when Erdogan became the prime minister first early 2003 uh, was the same with Poland and twice of Bulgaria and Romania. Obviously, Bulgaria and Romania weren't exactly the same, but Turkey was uh, about twice of Romania and slightly more than uh, Bulgaria. And fast forward 20 years later, all those countries, and I'm not picking the three that makes the most difference, just the three that looks very similar in terms of uh, their their structure of the economy. Uh, Poland is now more than twice of Turkey's GDP per capita, and both Bulgaria and Romania have actually surpassed Turkey. So Turkey actually talked about this great run in 2000s, but when you compare it with its competitors, it did okay, but in the first 10 years and really lagged behind the second 10, mostly because those European countries did the necessary steps, whereas Turkey was basically simply spending uh, the inflows of capital and all the assets that the Republic had established in its first 70, 80 years and AKP simply sold them and, and spend the money. Uh, so starting 2011, things started to get tighter and, and the flow had slowed down somewhat. And then uh, actually, when you look at the Turkish uh, economy, things started to deviate. First, you could see that the reserve of the central bank peaked in summer of 2011. Since then, they've been sliding. As of this call, uh, Turkey's uh, reserves, central bank reserves, is negative $68 billion. <laughs> I mean, there aren't that many countries in the world with negative reserves, let alone negative uh, $68 billion is close to negative 10% of the GDP, right? I mean, uh, that's a huge, tremendous hole to dig oneself in. Uh, but that was a long path that started in 2011. Things have deteriorated much more rapidly in 2018 after Erdogan became the president and installed his son-in-law as the all-powerful number two and the char of the economy. And things have turned really, really south then. But it was kind of unavoidable, inevitable in the following sense that the populist policies has taken Turkey so far and things were coming to an end. They were looking for a magic without really making the necessary sacrifices. So small mistakes led to a bigger mistakes, trying to manipulate, try to win yet one more election, led to more mistakes. And today, Turkish economy is basically at a path to disaster. Uh, the elections are in 11, 12 days. If it were a couple months later, Turkey would have actually uh, been in a serious balance of payment crisis. Uh, as of now, Turkey's reserves, the gross reserves, are there for a few more months. After that point, Turkey doesn't have, as you know, Turkey is a net importer of energy and many other things. And, and right now, the, the current account deficit is running at a pace larger than 5% of the GDP. And given the reserves are negative and that negative and there is no inflow, Within a few months, Turkey will have to make tough choices, whether they want to pay for the natural gas from Russia or the oil or uh, intermediate goods for its industry or the food. Turkey had become a net importer of, of food uh, as well. Uh, and all of this cannot be paid at the same time. So Turkey will have to make tough choices or Turkey will have to uh, uh, left the current policies and move to whole set of new policies uh, and Erdogan, if he wins the election, I suspect instead of going through a tough balance of payment crisis where he has to uh, go to complete capital controls, he'd rather probably make a U-turn and possibly go back to IMF and even another standby. But that's obviously beyond what Jim had asked me. So I'll stop here. Yeah, yeah no, no. Thank you so much for that, Bill Gay. And it, it, it does get at something that I think... Um, you know, it is a little, it's a, it's a disconnect that you see in the narratives about Turkey over the last 20 years. And, you know, what you lay out of, you know, what, what I think a lot of people saw is this like, you know, surprising success had this kind of fly in the ointment, this like problem that underlied uh, a lot of those policies that's only been exacerbated by uh, you know, the, you know, in one sense, a kind of clientelist construction network that's been built up over the last 10, 15 years. Uh, which I mean, you can see the fruit of. You visit Istanbul, uh, you know, you visit any large city 
in Turkey, uh, you see you know massive, massive high rises, and you really have to question about how many people there are to fill them. Um, so, uh, the, I think you laid this out very nicely. Um, I want to, I guess, turn uh, to you know the kind you you mentioned this like balance of payments crisis, this need for. Uh, direct investment to shore up uh, cash reserves. This is a, a running theme of uh, Turkish economic policies and foreign policy in Turkey over the last uh, several years, but in particularly the last few months. For Erdogan, it would seem, you know, looking at this issue that his his band-aids on this problem have been going to the Gulf, particularly first to Qatar, but then also UAE and Saudi also cutting deals uh, with Russia in order to get influxes of cash that might at least, you know, prop up the uh, economy a little bit or prop up the lira a little bit from sliding any further. Um, what is the opposition's view on these investments that have been made by uh, countries in the Gulf? And, you know, is that something that, you know, should you guys win? Would would that, is that something that would continue alongside uh, investment from elsewhere or would it be replaced by some other uh, US scheme? Dima, excellent. I mean, these are always the expert uh, observations. Uh, uh, one thing is that uh, one has to recognize is Erdogan blamed UAE for the coup attempt of 2016. And Erdogan correctly blamed Saudi Arabia for the murder of Khashoggi. Mm -hmm. Right. So both of those countries were, in quotations, enemies of Erdogan. And Erdogan played fairly tough ball with them for a number of years. As the economy deteriorated, Erdogan actually completely stepped back and gave concessions. And, and he completely conceded the Khashoggi investigation and turned the entire investigation to Saudi uh, crown prince. And similarly, from the UAE, he stepped back from his accusations of supporters of the coup and so on and so forth. That obviously is not good foreign policy. I mean, UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia, with all respect to both of them, are not world powers. And, and Turkey uh, kind of taking a harsh positions towards them and then eventually considering all, their, all of its points, all of her points, and completely causing the points because of its economic hardships actually is fairly uh, big failures, I, I would think, in foreign policy. Uh, and, and then he started to actually uh, receive some aid from Saudi Arabia, especially. Saudi Arabia was somewhat successfully using unwritten or unspoken sanctions against Turkey. Obviously, Saudi Arabia is being Saudi Arabia without officially having sanctions against Turkey, leaning, leaning against its companies, have effectively had a sanction against Turkey, not allowing Turkish companies to export to Saudi Arabia. That immediately was released as soon as Turkey returned all the Kashyyyk files and investigation to Crown Prince. And soon after, uh, Saudi Arabia in, uh, deposited $5 billion uh, to Turkish Central Bank. Uh, so what's happening right now is that Turkey is trying to survive until the election. So Turkey is getting money from Erdogan's friends in order to survive. So some of these friends of Erdogan is helping Erdogan to kind of win the election. But I wouldn't think Saudi Arabia and United Arab, Arab Emirates are on Erdogan's corner for uh, long term. I mean, this is a transactional deal for them. And and at the end of the day, I'm sure they will be they would like to be in good terms with the new administration as well. Uh, if anything, they probably find uh, President Erdogan somewhat of an unreliable partner, not necessarily for long term strategic partnership, but rather short term transactional things. Uh, and and I or in any of the none of our uh, strategic. Uh, partners in, in our opposition against Erdogan would be against capital coming from Gulf, Europe, or somewhere else. But, but the issue that this isn't really an investment, it's more like uh, Erdogan was desperate and he got these loans just to close the gap in current account deficit as opposed to having an investment from those countries. And those are really result of 
diplomatic uh, concessions that Erdogan gave. So that isn't really a healthy relationship uh, that Turkey would like to or should continue with those countries. Having said that, after the power shift in Turkey, I'm sure we'll have better relationship with Gulf countries uh, and we'll have a fairly healthy financial relations as well. So we're not necessarily against having capital or uh, partners from uh, Middle East neighbors, but the nature of the partnership right now is is not desirable the way Turkey has characterized them at this moment. Russia is something else. Russia obviously is led by Mr. Putin, and Putin and Erdogan obviously have a lot in common, and they are allies of each other, yet Turkey and Russia have a lot of conflict of interest that has been running around more than a few centuries. But uh, as two leaders, they need each other and they help each other. And Putin is known to interfere in other countries' uh, domestic uh, issues and special elections. And, uh, and he's supporting Erdogan. As we speak, there is an inflow into Turkey's central bank. And nobody knows what the source of it. Uh, so and when you look at the Turkish central bank's non-resident liabilities are increasing. And, and I would speculate that that's Russia injecting capital as Erdogan needs until the election, trying to float the economy, averting or delaying the inevitable, which is a balance of payment crisis. So that kind of relationship isn't healthy. And Turkey has developed a rather asymmetric relationship with Russia in energy, in security. Obviously, I don't need to tell you about S-400 uh, disaster and debacle and so on and so forth. So that obviously needs to change for Turkey's own sake. Needless to say, Turkey should have good relationship with its neighbor. I mean, there are things that Turkey and Russia cooperate on uh, for mutually beneficial agreements. But this kind of an asymmetric relationship where Turkey relies uh, on Russia, on energy too much, you know, we just built a nuclear plant completely owned by uh, Russians. Uh, so although the plant is in Turkey, it's owned by Russia and Russia is ex effectively exporting electricity to Turkey while Turkey takes all environmental and other risks. And so, so it's just a, a remarkable success for Russia to have actually this kind of agreement with a neighboring country. Uh, so that kind of stuff obviously needs to end. And, and going forward, uh, once Turkey actually straightens out its problems uh, and establishes a macroeconomic stability and goes back to a rule of law country, Turkey will actually be a very attractive uh, place to invest in. And I would argue that Turkey will be the trade of the decade, next decade. And I can fill this in if you'd like in later parts of the conversation. So Turkey will attract quite a bit of capital from abroad if our, our neighbors from the Gulf area want to invest in Turkey. Obviously, we'll welcome that. But investments should not come with this kind of political and diplomatic uh, prices to pay for Turkey. So as I understand it, you know, the, the bet here is that the return to rule of law, the end of corruption, cutting strings with uh, this kind of economic po foreign policy for sale, which is what you characterize as, and I think that's a correct uh, you know, kind of characteriz characterization of what Erdogan's been doing uh, with with folks in the Gulf and Russia, at least over the last year or so, um, is that you know, we we if if Turkey corrects all of this, you know, quote unquote bad behavior uh, in terms of you know in terms of corruption and returning to something more democratic and rule rule of law, investment will materialize, you know, to the point that you know. Perhaps this crisis can be averted. What other pieces, you know, do, do you see as uh, necessary to av avoid this looming balance of payments crisis uh, you, that you see coming in the next couple of months? Yeah, I mean, there are a couple of uh, must-haves or uh, necessary conditions for Turkey's recovery. One is establishing macroeconomic stability that obviously has monetary and fiscal components. Turkey is using a monetary policy that basically abuses the word monetary, monetary <laughs> because Turkey is arguing that inflation can be cured by lowering the interest rates. 
Uh, Erdogan is the only person that I know of who would argue such a thing against mounting evidence. Uh, completely irrelevant central bank at this point. The central bank's domestic uh, policy rate is at 8.5%. Inflation was fluctuating between 50 to 80%. And I'm sure Jim knows this, but for the rest of the audience, uh, Turkish Statistical Institute is fabricating numbers. And, and there is ample evidence that inflation is 20 to 30 percent higher than what Turkish Statistical Institute is saying. So you can view this as Turkish inflation last year had been fluctuating between 70 to 100 percent. So in an environment like this, having an eight and a half percent annual policy rate is ridiculous. It's basically completely ineffective. So, so there has to be a new management with a first rate independent central bank with its transparent and reliable policies, implementing an inflation targeting system, a first rate monetary policy needs to be inserted. And Turkey has the human capital for this, ironically, but none of it under Erdogan's leadership. So I have built together a team of Turkish economists that the country can muster together, professors like myself from leading schools, uh, relatively mid to high level officers in IMF, the bank, and then number of economists from uh, uh, banks, leading uh, US banks, as well as European banks. So all putting with a team together and bringing back uh, most of the top bureaucrats who have been forced out by Erdogan's cronies in the last decade and a half from central bank and the treasury, we will put together a team from that day one, will be a first rate team. Obviously, Turkey doesn't have the numbers like the Fed has, so we're not going to have thousands of economists at the caliber that the Fed has, but I would compare us more to, to Israel. Sure. That will have a smaller team, but of the same quality. Uh, so, so Turkey has the quality in smaller numbers, and you don't need hundreds of research economists, to be honest with you, to run an effective monetary policy at the bank, and that's what we'll do. Similarly, the fiscal policy needs to be reshaped. Needless to say, there has to be some tightening and, and there is going to be some pain, uh, but that's inevitable, uh, which will bring down the inflation rapidly in Turkey. But at the same time, the other thing that we have to do is that we have to bring uh, the rule of rule back. I mean, uh, uh, Turkey's uh, judiciary system is completely under the control of the corrupt senior leadership of Erdogan's administration, uh, rule of law needs to become needs to come back to Turkey and only then Turkey will be open for investments. Having said that, once the monetary policy is set, foreign direct investment not necessarily flow in right away, especially not while we have this lack of rule of law, but but the the, the portfolio investments will follow directly. In the next 12 months, I expect uh, slightly more than $100 billion of uh, portfolio investments into Turkish uh, treasuries as well as the Turkish stock market. So obviously, the world economy is going to go through some rough times starting the second half of 2023. I'm telling this as a Wharton professor, not necessarily a Turkish politician, looking at the U.S. economy, there's, I think, significant chance of slowing down, induced by uh, central bank policies, obviously. And this may not be good news for a country, Turkey, in some ways, but at the same time, the opportunity is fairly big in Turkey. None of it, uh, what Turkey has done, uh, with the polarization on the world, with Russia and China and all, uh, Turkey is one of the rare countries with some certain size that can attract actually capital that is earmarked for emerging markets. Mm -hmm. I think Turkey, once we straighten out its problems, will be a very good target where assets are really cheap and, and there is still a tremendous amount of uh, uh, capital that is waiting to be dispersed into emerging markets uh, from North American, East Asian, as well as European uh, asset managers. So, so, so I'm fairly optimistic that we'll have some breathing room and and for central bank to uh, buy some of these inflows and uh, and get out of these negative reserves fairly quickly. Inflation will be tough to fight. 
to be honest with you. And it's going to gradually come down. One negative issue is that we have local elections in spring of 2024, which means that my partners uh, will put pressure on me to actually slow down the pace of the austerity program in order to win the mayorships. Uh, we'll find out how that plays out. I mean, uh, at this point, obviously, they're not saying anything to me. I'm putting all the necessary programs. Everyone is cheering from the sideline. But as soon as we're in the office and I'm appointed as the uh, minister that takes care of the treasury and the economy, I'm sure I will be called into the president's office and will be asked to take it easy and so on and so forth. But time will tell how that plays out. Uh, so I'll stop here, Jim. I, yeah, I'm, sure. No, I'm, no, this is... I'm becoming a professor speaking way too much, and you're too polite. Yeah, well, you know, I think uh, you know we're we're learning a lot for sure, and, and you know, I think you 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 point out something that is uh, you know ha was a huge issue in that critical period that you were describing earlier in the 2010s. Um, you know, as Erdogan's economic policies were developing, there were elections nearly every year. I mean, the the kind the campaign did not stop. We all had fatigue watching this between 2011 and 2018, and this is now the first election that has happened in Turkey since uh, 2019. Uh, the local elections that happened that year. So it, there's a also a danger of this cycle restarting <laughs> even under a new administration, which makes things things difficult. Not on the you know point about uh, inflation. I mean, this is uh, you know I think it's important to note for our audience that you know another key factor uh, in Erdogan's economic policies has been, you know, a very unorthodox approach to interest rates. Um, you know, he has he never, you know, once, uh, you know, instructed anybody to raise interest rates uh, in face of the inflation that Turkey is facing. Uh, I think, in fact, uh, last week or the week before, he was speaking at a rally. Uh, and, you know, his message was, if the opposition wins, interest rates will only go up. Uh, if I win, interest rates will only go down. Um, and you know that 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 can be a very odd problem to face as a politician, I'm sure. <laughs> um, I have I have just maybe one or two other questions. We've got a lot in in the Q and A section already, so I just want to remind folks that you can uh, you know place a question into the Q and A box uh, if you like, and I'll, we'll get to as many of them as we can. Uh, also, if uh, I, I just want to remind folks about the feedback forms that have been posted in the chat. The, the last question I have, and we may return to some other things, is, you know, I, I want to ask another about another hallmark of Erdogan's, um, you know, economic policies, which have been these massive construction ventures. I mean, we, we talked a bit about building apartment buildings and whatnot, but, you know, we're talking, a, you know, it goes so much farther than that. A, you know, an enormous new airport, a third bridge over the Bosphorus. Uh, and the next thing on tap is a giant canal uh, that is meant to bypass the Bosphorus as a as a shipping lane between the Black Sea uh, and the Marmara. Um, just last week, uh, Kemal Kilicdaroglu had a video uh, talking about what I, I thought was a JHP style mega project, which was rehabilitating the defunct Ataturk airport uh, and turning it into a spaceport and research center. Uh, in a partnership with the Sierra Nevada Corporation, uh, which is a science and tech firm run by Turkish American billionaires Fatih and Aaron Özmen. So I, I wanted to ask, you know, in general, what is the opposition's approach to mega projects and, you know, a possible the possible planned canal? But also, if there's anything else you can tell us uh, about this uh, project uh, or plan announced by Kilostrolu last week. Yeah, I mean, obviously, people are trying to win an election against the populist some of the best responses often become other populist policies inadvertently. Uh, but somebody who's going to write the checks, most likely, <laughs> I can assure you that, that there will not be big projects coming in. And, and some of these big mega projects in Turkey are somewhat silly. And they are not naive, though. I mean, it's not like Erdogan is an idiot. These projects are how he actually collects rent and distributes rent. Turkish government works like organized crime. And I'm not saying this lightly, and I'm not trying to be funny either. I mean, politics is dirty, is corrupt everywhere, but Turkey is at a very high level. I mean, Erdogan is the basis sits at the top and cut gets a cut from everything, and it's a complete corrupt system. And one of the reasons why Erdogan loves big construction projects is because 
it's 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 very corruptible. It's it's very rent seeking, and and some of the stuff is not environmentally good. Makes no sense. Turning Turkey into an island of I'm sorry, the Istanbul into an island through this canal is really stupid. Especially considering the fact that uh, Istanbul is an earthquake zone, similar to uh, fault line in uh, California, and and connecting Istanbul. Uh, through this canal, making the main stay between the Bosphorus and this canal, and having only three bridges on each side, at an earthquake, even the help cannot come to a city of 15 million people. It just makes no sense. Uh, so we're really against it. There is no economic sense other than it's going to create more uh, construction and opportunities for uh, land speculation, mostly purchased by his cronies to begin with the land around the canal, which would have a good view of the canal has all been sold. And I think that needs to be stopped. With respect to the airport in Istanbul, the other airport, the, the biggest airport in Istanbul, there were only two before. And the larger one was fairly new. A lot of new extensions was built. Scraping that new airport to build yet a bigger airport <laughs> made no sense. I mean, Turkey could need a third. I mean, Istanbul could have needed a third airport. We could argue that. I mean, like New, new York City has Newark, LaGuardia and JFK, and Istanbul could have those three airports. It's a big city spread into two different continents. It's a very large city. It's much larger than New York metropolitan area. So one can justify three airports, but why shut down the your new <laughs> larger airport? It's such a big waste, and the new airport is so big, it's just too big in some ways, right? I mean... You land in Istanbul airport, you taxi for 25 minutes. <laughs> Walking from one gate to another takes another half hour. Yeah, wear I mean, comfortable airport, shoes if you're flying through there. <laughs> exactly. It just makes no sense. It could have been a smaller, middle-sized, good-sized airport. When you compare Istanbul airport to Newark or LaGuardia, JFK, Istanbul airport is so much bigger than all of that. Was it really necessary as a third airport in the city? No. But of course, to justify this big construction, they shut down the larger airport in Istanbul and completely wasted the space. And now our candidate, Kemal Kristol, is trying to make some use of it. And I'm not sure what is the best use of it. So we'll find that out. Uh, but clearly, it's been a silly way. So going forward, these big construction projects needs to slow down. And Turkey has overinvested in infrastructure in that way. There are bridges, no one passes. There are airports, few thousand people a year users, right? I mean, some of these airports had plans to use 1 million passengers a year, and then it turns out like 35,000 passengers use it a year. And clearly, these airports are completely unnecessary. And when you look at the economics right now, they're big waste. But nevertheless, he built all of those things. So, so Turkey has uh, to slow those things. And we have to control the budget deficits. So no more of this nonsense. So we're not going to see big airports built for a while. No new bridges to nowhere. I mean, you have a bridge over Chanakkale Strait. I don't know whether you needed a bridge over there, to be honest with you. Uh, very few cars or trucks ever passes by. But you have invested the bridge that costs more than a billion dollars. I mean, that kind of stuff uh is is just not much more than pork and bale politics at this stage it's just simply corruption well we could talk about this uh you know i think between us for a very long time but i want to make some space here for some of the questions that have come in i'm going to try and just read them back here so that folks later when they're um you know watching on youtube uh you know know what the question was before we start answering it i want to go to a question from uh, dr sinem sonmez who is uh, an economics lecturer at fordham uh, and she writes, I'm going to read this uh, verbatim. Uh, she wanted to find out how you can, uh, how you can, can you say that Kamal Dervish has has done uh, what that what Kamal Dervish had done has been beneficial to the country when in fact uh, they are the cause of Turkey's dependence today on other countries for imports. Given the fact that Dervish and IMF's proposals had resulted in massive privatiz privatization efforts, which led Turkey to sell most of its pri prized uh, state-owned enterprises to local and overseas investors. She has a second question, which is whether you anticipate Turkey going to the IMF for additional loans, especially because of the earthquake-related fiscal spending is expected to be around 3 to 4% of GDP. Um, 
So I guess it, it goes on from there, but I think those are two key questions that are worth focusing in on in terms of the diagnosis uh, from the original IMF program. You know, obviously there are, you know, there's a relationship between privatization and the corruption of, uh, you know, of uh, underneath Erdogan, uh, but it may not necessarily be a one-to-one. -one. Also, I mean, it, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, creating the space uh, in Turkey for more investment, you know, is IMF in the picture there or not? Uh, and do, or do we, do we just not know? Sure. Uh, starting with Sinam's questions, oh, I won't forget the questions because you had other yeah. good points, uh, Jim, uh, is that I don't always want to open old wounds. I mean, Kemal Davis is a good economist. There are things I don't agree with and there are things that he did very well, but Needless to say, one has to give credit where the credit is due. His austerity program did work. And in fact, that made uh, Erdogan a success story. Without Kemal Davish's austerity program, Erdogan wouldn't have been this successful. Uh, having said that, there are things that I don't agree with uh, Kemal Davish's program, especially the standard IMF program where austerity programs the easiest way to succeed is make the lower income families pay the bill and make the sacrifice. And that was a little bit of that. And that was fairly standard in those days in IMF programs. Uh, with respect to uh, Turkish privatization and selling of the assets, Erdo I mean, Kemal Darvish's program actually successfully restructured and brought the rules of law, rules in the economy that potentially laid the path to a success story, which didn't turn out to be in the long run, but not because of his mistake, kind of banking regulation, ACC-like regulation, and so on and so forth in the uh, Turkish financial markets were all due to him. So he did succeed in many aspects in that sense. The privatizations can be good or bad, depending on what you do. Not everything should be privatized, but one could argue that state-owned enterprises that the inefficient run should be privatized. The issue is that after Kemal Davis stepped down, most of the privatizations took place after him under the corrupt leadership of Erdogan. So I think it will be a little harsh to blame Kemal Davis for all that corruption that he was not part of. And in those days, privatization of these state enterprises that were run so inefficiently and causing to budget deficits, that was kind of, the common wisdom in those days. So one cannot blame that. The thing is that that was taken to a level that I don't think Kemal Davish envisioned, nor he would endorse it. And especially the way they were sold to Erdogan's cronies. I, I mean, as much as I would criticize Kemal, I think it would be a little too harsh <laughs> to put all the blame on his uh, footsteps. So uh, with respect to uh, the IMF, I think if Erdogan wins, he really has two paths. One path is to disaster, a balance of payment crisis where Turkey really becomes a country like Azerbaijan or Turkmenistan without oil and gas. Mm -hmm. But the chronic chronic deficit and with a lot of autocracy. And Turkey cannot sustain that. And Erdogan knows it. So more wisely, he will make a U-turn to more orthodox policies. But as soon as he does that, you will find out that he will need IMF. Because Erdogan lacks the credibility, lacks the human capital to put together an austerity program. And for him, uh, IMF would be the only way out. And, and I don't think an IMF program under his administration is going to be successful either. It's just they're going to be a model through very similar to what Argentina has done with this la latest IMF uh, program. So I think either way, Turkey is going to be a tough place to be a citizen of. Uh, after Erdogan wins, if he wins, whether he is going to take this, this non-orthodox path to disaster or he takes a more orthodox path to muddle through under IMF, uh, I think it's just going to be a fairly unpleasant thing. And I think his party's ability to remain in power without more autocracy and police force was going to be diminished further. Um, with respect to Turkey's cures, and I'm not sure that... I kind of forgot your question, but I'm kind of trying to remember it. And it's about going forward. Uh, do we really need the IMF? Well, if the right thing comes to par with the credibility, I don't think Turkey needs IMF. In the sense that the IMF program is neither necessary 
nor sufficient for success. Mm-hmm. It will be helpful if it's done well. But at the same time, Erdogan made IMF discussion such a toxic topic. Mm-hmm. Its potential benefit is overwhelmed with its political costs. So if I do get the seat and run the economy, we're going to steer away from IMF. Needless to say, we have a lot of friends in IMF and other places, and they will appreciate the quality of our program and they may endorse it. But I don't expect to have a standby under our administration at IMF. No, no, thank you for that. And I know it's a tough question, uh, just you know, politically <laughs> at the moment. And I think that's a, that's a, a fair and honest answer. So um, I want to move to uh, a question from Mark Imperatori. Uh, what are your plans for uh, economically underdeveloped, underdeveloped product provinces in the country, in particular uh, eastern provinces? Is there a specific focus within uh, you know, the opposition's economic policy that focuses on the east? Yeah, I mean, Turkey had specific policies towards east, especially southeast, in terms of incentives and all, but they don't work well. because Partly because Turkish incentive structures throws money at the problem without economic thinking, without an impact analysis. So Turkey needs to restructure its incentive structures, not for the Southeast only, but for the entire country. And and we have to actually reward performance and incentivize people to do the right thing. I'm an economist. I believe people do what they're incentivized to do. The current Turkish incentive structures simply throws money to people and sectors and regions in order to sustain uh, poverty. But I mean, we are transferring wealth to Southeast, not to develop Southeast, but more like making poverty more sustainable. Uh, And I think that's what needs to change for the country. So it's not a specific Southeastern or Eastern parts of the country. It's more like, yes, some segments of the society and regions needs to be developed and government has to incentivize people to invest in those areas but the incentives have to be designed to incentivize people as opposed to simply transfer wealth i mean it's obviously convenient when simply you transfer wealth to some cronies of yourself under this incentive mechanism the so-called incentive mechanism it's very nice it just enriches people at the taxpayers uh, expense and that ought to stop uh, so i'll give you one uh, very bold statement Turkey is one of the most generous countries uh, in OECD uh, as a fraction of its uh, GDP in terms of providing subsidies. But Turkey never has designed those policies in an impact analysis way, in a formal way. And more scary, never collected data and measured to see whether the incentive structure really worked, those money was well spent or not. So actually, we are the first group to do that and collect the data, and the results just looks abysmal. Turkey is simply wasting its resources, whether it's the southeast or elsewhere. So Turkey just needs to design these incentive structures, collect the data, and have a data-driven incentive structure as opposed to ad hoc decisions. All right, so I, I have a ton of questions in the chat. <laughs> I want to thank everybody for uh, submitting uh, the questions and their interests. We're, we're unable, unfortunately, to get them all. Maybe we'll have to invite you back after the elections to, to get to some of them. I, w- I do want to, uh, we have time for one more. So I, I'm just going to pitch one more question here for you, and then we'll, we'll close it off with that. Uh, so this is from uh, Aicha Chala Sahilolo. Uh, do you have an incentive program uh, to reverse immigration from Turkey? Engineers, doctors, scientists, other potential young professionals. Uh, Turkey, we, we've heard a lot about Turkey's brain drain over the last 10 or 15 yeah. years. Uh, Jim, obviously, these are very good questions. And two out of three of the questions are coming from Turkish citizens just trying to understand from the names. In fact, the first economist is somebody I know personally. So this <laughs> is becoming go. more of a Turkish conversation. Uh, but the, the, the last question is a very, very important one. In fact, uh, she might know that one of the key reasons as to why I went back to Turkey and got into this mess is to help the next generation. And and Turkey's young generation is really getting uh, a very bad deal. Uh, especially the white-collar workers in Turkey pays very high taxes. 
the income taxes are very high and the brackets very quickly goes to 40% income tax. And then because government doesn't collect taxes other than the payroll very well, uh, they have these special consumption taxes. So if you actually buy a Honda CRV uh, hybrid in Turkey, it costs $110,000 because there's so much tax on it, right? There is 278% tax on cars with uh, engines bigger than two liters. Not to say engines small are really cheap either, but this is the peak. So when you look at that kind of uh, taxing system, uh, it becomes very difficult for people to have any uh, high standards because the white color uh, people with white color jobs pays high taxes. Then they end up with very high consumption taxes, like special consumption taxes on cars, telephones, anything, alcohol, name it. And, and then the government managed to bankrupt the education system. So if you want your child, and most watch colored people want their child, uh, their children to have good education, you have to send them to private school. The, the healthcare system is collapsing, was flourishing at first, but last few years it's been getting pretty bad. So if you want access to good doctors, you have to have private insurance. And then most of these people do not rely on government for security. They all live in the secure development. So they have to pay for security. So, so you pay all that taxes, you get no education benefit, no healthcare benefit and no security. So why are you paying all those taxes? On top of it, Erdogan polarizes the country and shows these uh, educated class as a target to the poor. And the salaries of the white collar jobs are getting closer and closer to minimum wage, right? As a multiple of minimum wage, professors, doctors, engineers make less and less every year. Relative. So on top of that, there are not economic issues where Erdogan actually puts pressures on people's uh, lifestyle choices. Uh, and, and if you send a Twitter that criticizes him, uh, you may be picked up from home at 5 a.m. and you may disappear in a Turkish judicial system weeks at a time and all that stuff. Uh, people are really afraid of their freedom uh, and, and so on and so forth. So all of that combined, it really has become a hostile place for people who can seek employment abroad and leave the country. And so I don't blame the younger generation. Uh, so that needs to be reversed, obviously. For it to be reversed, uh, first, we have to bring back rule of one democracy to the country. That's going to happen fairly quick after the election. But the economic situation will improve, but it will improve over time. Uh, and, and one could have specific targeted incentive structures for especially researchers, universities, and so on and so forth. But really for the workforce, I think one would be a little naive to think that broad structures would work right away. Turkey has limited resources, and I'm not the kind of politician that who promises things he cannot deliver. But in that sense, I'm not a politician at all. Especially in Turkey, politicians like me is bound to disappear. Uh, <laughs> but, but anyways, I try to be this unique uh, character where I promise things that I can only deliver. And I think what I can promise to the young generation that who has left or thinking about leaving the country is that I understand why you're doing it. My heart is with you. I don't blame you. You're right. But things will improve in Turkey. Uh, your democratic rights, your basic rights will come back right away. And the economic situation will improve dramatically every year. And, and your standard of living, your ability to uh, sustaining life standard that you deserve and you could easily get in especially Western Europe or North America. Turkey will get there. We need a little bit of patience, but things will improve every year. Uh, and, 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 and we are going to reward merit. That's something that Erdogan was so good at destroying in the society. Uh, we will make sure meritocracy works again. I personally am the product of meritocracy-based system in Turkey. Turkey was never a rich country, but the, the system worked. It was a merit-based thing. I am, for example, a product of 
uh, Turkish public education. I've never set foot in a private school in Turkey. The first private school I attended was as a PhD student at Princeton. And coming to Princeton, being raised by the Turkish system, a middle-income country, I probably was the best prepared student at the first year PhD program at Princeton. And that speaks a lot. Uh, but that kind of success story is no longer possible for the current generation. And I think we owe it back to the country to reestablish that kind of a merit-based society where people with skills and hard work can actually go through the ladder and, and, and have social mobility, which doesn't exist nowadays. Well, thank you so much, uh, Bilge, for taking the time out to join us today. I know it's an incredibly busy time uh, for you. I know it's late there. I know I, this is primetime TV in Turkey, but it's... <laughs> uh, yeah, Jim, I, it, I don't <laughs> sleep much, so it's okay. <laughs> this this had been more of a resting period for me, entertaining, if you will, from <laughs> okay, Turkish well, politics. I'm, I've been impressed by 400 people every day on the streets <laughs> of... Uh, Turkey. So this is uh, this had been a walk in the park. So okay, thank well, you for for this break from my daily routine. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. And and we'll we'll have to have you back after the elections at some point to see how things are going. I, I think we've done a, a fairly good job here to lay out really the scale of the challenge uh, ahead. I don't envy you or anyone else running for office in Turkey right now. Uh, the problems are enormous, uh, and they're very consequential. And I, I think, you know, whatever happens, I think, you know, we all sort of, you know, we wish the best for the, the country. It's, it, it means a lot to me personally uh, to see the country succeed. Um, and uh, I just want to say one more time, thank you to those who joined us today from all over the place. We had a great audience here live. Uh, and for, uh, once again, our, our donors, our supporters, uh, our board members who make this stuff possible, um, we couldn't do it without you. So again, uh, please fill out the feedback forms if you get a chance, and we'll see you again soon. We have a lot of Turkey uh, material coming up on our website, and there will be more events uh, you know, after the election. So thank you so much, and have a great day. My pleasure. Thank you, Jim.